and I'm with All Ideas Matter. Yeah, and, All Ideas Matter. Yep, and, and it's great to be see, here. Yeah, it's great to see, hang out again. Um, yep. We were just discussing, just before I did the intro, um, we were just discussing Tim Pool and how he he says he's on the left, but then he espouses a lot of the same ideas as those on the right. And um, you were saying, you, you were actually putting a pretty good point there. So I'll let you have at it. <laughs> well, uh, uh, th thank you. Uh, so basically the point that I was trying to get towards with uh, Tim Poole and specifically is that I think what he's doing right now and this is just from what I've seen of his more recent outputs. Um, I believe what he's doing, you know, is that he's doing the kind of like the center lefty culture war hustle, where it's kind of a, a persona that someone takes, where it's just like, you know, I'm, you know, where they claim to be a leftist of some sort, like they're on the left or. Or in some cases, it's a newer thing where they'll just say, I used to be on the left, but that's a different thing. But yeah, they'll claim to be center left, especially they'll say that's where I am on the political compass. They usually remember to leave in that part. And but the thing is, the people who they in theory should be ideologically aligned with, they do much more to to like undercut their politic their efforts and their beliefs and policies and their actions and they instead choose to to like steel man the opposition you know the right wing people and and so i think specifically now this this is representative more of uh, his timcast channel but i think that what he's doing is that basically he's it, it's it like i said it's a hustle it's in this whole culture war YouTube, you know, it's one of those things where if you if you really want to make it big here, you have to appeal to the right wing, you know, to like the more conservative element of YouTube. And so you'll have people like Tim Pool doing this hustle where like they'll they'll claim a unique perspective because it's a, it's itself a niche within the marketplace of ideas. And so I mean, that's Basically, all, all there is, all I have to say about it. I mean, even so, if he said, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I was thinking, though, that um, the reason, yeah, I can understand where your, your viewpoint is, but um, my disagreement with it would be that um, I think a lot of people that were once left, like I would consider myself in some ways socially liberal, you know, uh, I I'm pretty open-minded in many ways, um, but uh, fiscally conservative would be my thing. But uh, a lot of people that were on the left were maybe sort of similar to me or maybe a little bit more uh, socially, uh, uh, like not so fiscally conservative, but, you know. Um, but in a way, the left has gone more to the extreme where you get more of a socialist tinged to the to, to the left and people who were once you know identified as left are now seen as being more on the right just because when you move the needle way over <laughs> everyone else seems like they're being left on the other side that they're being pushed towards the right just by how far things have shifted um, Tim Pool, I feel like has gone that way because he was there for Occupy Wall Street. He was, you know, he's very uh, socially um, left wing or politically left wing leaning. Um, yeah, I mean, I I can accept, you know, what he's done in the past and everything, but like I th I think still that what he's currently doing isn't a justification of that. It's not a justification of his current actions. And also for another thing, like the whole idea of the left becoming too, too extreme and everything, you know, it's kind of part of the marketing strategy of it, I would say. Because, you know, there's plenty of left-wing people, myself included, you know, who, who are very principled about what we believe, but we, 
we don't fully align with you know the the extreme identity politics you know that that is often talked about in in like the culture war video sphere you know mm-hmm. yeah and so 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 yeah but the another thing though is just like when he it's more comes down more to like when he brings policy in, into things because that's where he really is on undercutting you know le- leftists it, and especially like with AOC mm-hmm. like in there, in his video that he made about the green new deal uh, what he did was he basically portrayed it as something that you know the the labor unions are super against it and so it, and he the way he frames that is that he he wants to make it look like he by his own words that AOC's new idea it's unrealistic and it's out of touch with the working class. Well, it, even yeah, but the it thing is pretty that unrealistic. <laughs> she wanted well, to basically retrofit all houses in in the United States. She wanted to stop all air travel. Uh, she wanted to get rid of all gas production, and she wouldn't wasn't open to the idea of nuclear energy which to me is the saving thing for uh, the environment. If you really want to produce energy, which is good for the environment uh, or not harmful to the environment, you would go nuclear. Nuclear is the best energy source that we have. But she was against that, and the Green New Deal basically prevents that. And a lot of the stuff within the Green New Deal is uh, like you know promising jobs to people <laughs> even if they don't want to work and all these kind of crazy ideas that were inside of it were just out to lunch. Okay. Well, did you read the bill itself? I read bits of it. Uh, I didn't read the whole thing. Um, I'd say I read like maybe 50%. Yeah. I, I would say I I read about the uh, first half of it myself. I, you know, I like, I didn't, I admit that it's probably something I wish I'd gone more into, but mm-hmm. um, ha- but at least from what I was reading, I didn't get the sense that like she was trying to do all these other things. I mean, that might come from a- any basis, in fact, that that has. It might come in to like a later part of it, but yeah. I mean, but specifically on the labor union issue. It, mm-hmm. the, the, him raising that specific issue is actually misleading because it says within the language of the bill itself that labor unions like should by necessity play a role in in this green new deal but the way that tim that tim frames it is is that he goes on in the fact that they weren't specifically contacted about about this before the writing of the bill mm-hmm. and yeah and and so i i think that it's there could potentially be other explanations for that rather than just her but i think it's he the specific the specific conclusion that he's trying to draw from that is intentionally like i think it's one of those things where like if you're if you're really it you know, like ideologically similar to these people, if you actually wanted them to succeed, you know, on the basis that you should in theory agree on some things and that they would be the people most I- identical to you ideologically, politically. And I mean, because criticism is fine, but the thing is uh, something like that you know, that's, it's completely non-productive. It doesn't help the, it doesn't the cause. help the cause. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, so yeah, I can understand your frustration with Tim on that. Um, yeah. I mean, personally being on the right, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, Tim, you're, you're totally right on this. Um, uh, so yeah. So I don't mind that uh, he doesn't uh, espouse all the I- I- ideological uh, beliefs that the left uh put forward um so i you know i I agree with his position when he 
takes more of a right wing um, viewpoint on it. Um, yeah, but I, 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 you know, you know, you you know, we've talked before. Um, you know that I'm against. I would be against unions. I'm not a union fan. Uh, I, I believe unions don't serve much purpose. Well, uh, I mean, I well, I would agree that some that certain artifacts within within capitalism that were that are historically pro like things like the minimum wage or the 40 hour work week for instance you know, yeah but the unions were, didn't get those yeah but i mean like i i mean i'm not most that the most versed on union stuff but like re really it's just in theory uh, the way a union should work is that like un unions should like form of, you know, in the interests of the workers, you know, they are, in theory, they should be like a natural, you know, count, countermeasure against the excesses of owners. But mm -hmm. now, I mean, I don't know too much about how unions function in this current economy. I, I admit that. But, you know, in, in principle, that's what a union should be. So, uh, I think yeah. I, I, I agree. That's what they should be. Um, but I actually don't see, I, I'm much more on the side of the capitalist, right? Because I'm a capitalist. <laughs> yeah, I get that. But I um, honestly, I, I don't feel like there's much I could debate about unions. So I don't yeah. see the conversation moving forward very far from that. But yeah. uh, part of a union? Do what? at your job, are you part of a union or? No, not specifically. But okay. um nice. But yeah, so even going back to what I was saying with Tim Pool is that is that especially he I really noticed like he kind of plays to the room a bit because uh, Tim he was at Jimmy Dore actually had him on fairly recently and okay. you know Jimmy Dore he's I yeah mean, I know, he's very he, left wing yeah I I think he's he's a problem in and of himself but he I mean still he's you could say left wing is clearly where you put him, you know, mm -hmm. as far as what what he publicly states. But the thing is, it's just like he, you know, he goes, he softens things a bit up, knowing that like where the people he's reaching there are leftists. So, like he, you know, he'll like he'll always do what he does on Jimmy Jimmy Dore's show, for instance, is that he. He'll start. He comes at it from a more like conciliatory. Conciliatory, I think that's the word. Yeah, yeah, conciliatory. He, he takes, yeah. yeah, he takes that viewpoint more. It's just like where he'll he'll like start by saying something something that a leftist would be in favor of that he is in favor of, but then he goes, but then he goes towards like the the right appealing to like the more right wing idea. You know, where like, can you, do you have like an example? Like, like I don't mean to put you on the spot. I, just, I, I didn't see the interview. So. Yeah, it's OK. I, I think the example I, I would say is uh, when he's talking about the Green New Deal, actually, because he okay. um, I want I mean, I forget exactly what he said he was in favor of. I think I think before that he said he was in favor of stuff like progressive taxation. Okay. I, I want to say he was in favor of like doing something about climate change, but basically the point of attack he made in in that specific uh, on that question was that he attacked the identity politics angle of it, which if you're just throwing out identity politics as a buzzword and not giving it context, what you would assume is that it's you know it's some SJW crap. But yeah. the but the thing is, if you look at the actual wording of the bill, you know, when it's talking about identity politics, it's just going overall, like just the people who are most disadvantaged in society. You know, what and it, it's not even just about like whether what, they're what people does that of color. Have to do with like like a green new deal. Like I mean, what does that have to do with the environment when they get into identity politics? Uh, well, what they get into it, it is that like these is that pre the previous new it's an acknowledgement that the previous New Deal, like when that had run its course, you know, the, mm -hmm. it acknowledged that certain groups were left out of the 
of like the benefit of that. So, you know. Yeah, I, I was against the original New Deal uh, from Roosevelt, right? Um, I think it, it actually, well, they actually, the they look, economists looked at it and they figured so if they he didn't do the New Deal, uh, probably the U, the U.S. would have gotten out of the depression about five years earlier. Um, and what reasons did they give for this? Um, the problem with the New Deal was it basically uh, created a huge tax burden, and it uh, took the free market and said, "No, no, we're not going to do the free market thing anymore. We're going to try to, you know, create government jobs, create government, you know, make work kind of things." And what it did is it 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 prevented people from resolving the problems themselves. And it, it just basically pro prolonged the depression. Uh, probably it would have been, you know, much more of a blip than uh, uh, if they had just let people <laughs> do their thing. Uh, the most of the time when governments get interventionist and try to prevent uh, the free market from just correcting itself, it actually slows down uh, the whole fixing like the the thing is with a free market you'll have like ups and downs it's just it's a, it's part of the free market system that companies will grow and then they'll collapse uh and then new companies will take out uh take you know come up into the market oh so you mean like boom bust cycle there's but it's not as bad as you might think it, it is boom bust uh but it's 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 like a whole bunch of micro boom busts um, yeah, well, I mean, I know personally I haven't gotten too much into the Marxist criticism of that, but I know it exists, but just go on. Yeah, so the point is that it's it's not like um, it has to be like something that goes across all sectors. It can be boom busts within just small com like within companies. Like the, a good example would be like, um, like a Sears or um, in Canada we have a, uh, the Hudson Bay Company. These are like companies that existed for hundreds of years. Were well, Sears not so much, but um, but they were like long established companies that just went under because they didn't evolve, they didn't uh, progress, and that happens. Those companies go bust, and then some new company like Walmart will come along and come, you know, take over. Then Walmart might fail because something like Amazon will come along. So there's always something new that will take uh, up the slack of these things that go bust. Well, the market kind of works as a whole like that, where things will fail and then other things will come into pit the picture that will fix the problem or you know, uh, replace the existing technologies within the, within the market. So if, but if you have a government that tries to intervene, Generally, what will happen is the old kind of dying companies that should just be let to die uh, will uh, will stay longer than they need to be, <laughs> need to stay. Like uh, I was really against, for example, the 2008 bailout. I mean, that's very anti-capitalist. They should have just let those companies fail. Uh, but, you know, they the government got in and bailed them out and it just prolonged the recession that the U.S. experienced in 2008. And it's the same that happened with the, the, the New Deal originally, that they prolonged the, the recessions that, that would have naturally sort of sorted themselves out. Okay, and uh, just about the whole New Deal thing, um, do you happen to have any sources on that uh, off the top of your head? Uh, um, I'm trying to think of some good sources. Um, you should really check out uh, Milton Friedman. He did a really good talk on it. It's a he's a very right well he's a right wing I, uh, economic. I, I know who he is. Yeah, um, but yeah, Milton Friedman. Uh, he's uh, he's very good. He's he 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 shows things in a very interesting perspective. Um, I, no, I know that's uh, that's kind of the repu reputation he has among certain people. But uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, he's he's you know he's he's put out some pretty good arguments um, that just look at things very factually and uh, with no no emotional attachment. You know, he tries to keep things very uh, cut and dry, 
and which is kind of nice because often we get our judgment clouded by uh, having some kind of emotional feeling. Like, for example, um, like if if my job is on the line, <laughs> I'm going to be passionate about saving it, right? Um, but if you look at it from a purely economic way, that passion is removed. And you say, well, your job is going to, is, you're either going to lose it now or you're going to lose it in a few years. Um, you better, you know, cut your losses and move on now when you're still in a good position to move on rather than waiting a few years. <laughs> you know, the, having that kind of almost very logical standpoint kind of can make you kind of see the picture from a much more realistic uh, standpoint, because a lot of the time we, 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 we run to the government or we run to our union, we run to all these things to save us. And really what we're doing is only prolonging the pain that we're going to suffer. Do you know what I mean? Uh, I, I kind of get what you mean there, but I, I, um, uh, personally, what I would like to know is, um, I'm guessing with ha having some familiarity with these arguments, um, does, does like his do his arguments really uh, bent? Are they fle more flexible to like people asking questions such as like why am I a losing my job or like why is this necessary? Um, so, and yeah, I I don't think they would be <laughs> actually. You might have him on that, but he, he, he looks at it as a purely economic thing. So if, if there's no, like, if there's no reason to keep a job then, and it's just not economically viable, then the job should be removed. There's no reason to maintain a job that has no economic advantage. Okay. And, uh, and I mean, to another thing, like when he gives these little prescriptions of of how how things are going to go like does 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 he say anything is like good good or beneficial no. or anything like that he never looks at it from a moral standpoint well i mean just even from like some kind of theoretical framework like he, does... he looks at it as economic good i guess um one of the best examples of sort of a way he would think was um i forgot what car it was um there was a car that if you hit the back end of the car it would explode oh the pento the pento thank you um and he you know somebody asked him about it and said well you know it was 13 dollars or something like that to fix this car okay to make it so that it wouldn't explode when bumped and he's he the the, the person asked him well why didn't like you know morally what they did was you know horrible they should have fixed the car and you know not had the safety concern and milton freeman he looked at it from a very different perspective he said well okay um you know it's 13 dollars to fix it uh how about so the question becomes how much is safety worth and they did the math within the company, right? That, and they determined that it was not worth $13 to fix it. I, and it sounds weird to, that they would make that conclusion, but they looked at the economics of it. And he said that you could make a car 100% safe, that basically you could wrap the car in bubble wrap, you could have like a million airbags, you know, you could, you could create um, a perfectly safe car but the cost would be, you know, insane. It would be like more than the whole world's production, you know, <laughs> because it, just to make that one car safe, right? So there's always a balance between safety and uh, the feasibility for economics. How, how much is our safety worth? And we, we make that decision Based, we're willing to take a certain amount of risk. Anything we buy, there is a certain amount of risk associated with it. And they they determined when they looked at the Pinto that it was not worth that thirteen dollars or whatever it was to fix the problem because the, the economic cost, like it would have just made the car 
not sell. Now, they, okay. uh, you know, it was kind of a very economic way of looking at it. And there was no emotion. Sure, people are going to get killed, <laughs> you know, but there's no emotions. It's just purely economic. I see. But yeah, and I would say like, eat, like as far as like a moral implication or not, even if you just take out a moral implication to it, mm -hmm. you know, eat, I, the question I would then ask is like, like I would say is not the price of safety equivalent to the price of life itself, you know? And I would say that life, it, like it's, it's a point, it's a futile effort to attempt to accurately give it, you know, a financial value. And even if it weren't, you know, then on a moral from a moral standpoint, or even an economical one, you could say that to to even claim that you can do such a thing and that it's proper to do it, you know, that could lead to that could have very widespread like social implications. This could be a justification, you know, for something that some for some act or some something that people can view as, you know, an atrocity even. And I mean, but, so, e but specifically, like, like with cars too. It it's actually funny because this was a thing with GM like five years ago or so too, where basically for that they had a problem with their ignitions and I know I had they, the, I had a GM. <laughs> well, well, I'm glad you're still here. But, I almost uh, got killed actually because of it, believe it or not. Ah, oh, well, my, refer to my previous statement. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it was another thing where it's like it, it was an even lower number, like maybe just a few cents to fix the problem with that. Like mm -hmm. all they needed was to get, I think, like a slightly shorter piece or something, replace all the cars with that. And yeah, it would I forget what the issue was, yeah. Yeah, it was something like that. But uh, basically they weighed their options and said like, yeah, it's, you know, it's just not worth it to, you know, cost, you know, to spare a few cents for each of the hundreds of thousands of cars that mm -hmm. would need to be fixed. And yeah. so just not going to do that. And basically they decided, like, even, even if you take an economical argument like that, like, basically you could say you can have this definite cost you know, for fixing the problem, or you could choose to eat the co the cost of a potential lawsuit down the line, you know? Yeah, exactly. And that's what they do calculate. There's actually, you know, the movie Fight Club? Uh, it's, it's a great hard movie. not yeah, to know it, but okay. Fight Club, it has Brad Pitt and um, um, something Norton, um, yeah. Edward Norton. Yeah, it's um, actually it's actually a funny little story. Um, I was a kid right around the time that movie came out, and my my dad really liked it, and he liked it so much that when he was he was watching me and my cousins, like he would have us do Kitty Fight Club. <laughs> awesome. I mean, yeah, it's. I mean, it it's not much to write home about. It's just basically imagine a grown man grabbing a a like let for lightly grasping a child's arms and making them throw punches at another child's face. Awesome. And yeah, yeah, that's basically all it was. This but. is what keeps therapists in business. Um. <laughs> yeah, well, I I don't have the money to make them rich, but uh, go on with Fight Club. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but in Fight Club, though, uh, Edward Norton's character, his job was to do the risk assessments for cars. Mm -hmm. And he basically would do the math. He would say, okay, um, there's gonna be this many accidents and it's gonna cause this many lawsuits. And what's the cost of that? And he'll like come out, crunch some number. And they look at that compared to how much just to fix the problem. And they weigh the, those two things and determine which is the better way to go. Do they fix the problem to avoid the lawsuits, which costs a certain amount of money, or do they just eat the damage that's gonna come out of these lawsuits and be, to save money on the 
the, the risk that they're taking. And it's, it's a purely economic um, argument that they make. Because there, as I said, you can make a car 100% safe, but the cost would make it maybe um, unrealistic. So you always have to weigh these two factors. Yeah, but like that's the thing though. Like I, I would say, re, you know, realistically speaking, even if you know, calculating the value of a life isn't realistic, but you know, you can calculate the things necessary to protect it, to prolong it. Well, and, they do calculate the value of a life. It's the value of a life is determined by how much somebody can sue you if you lose that life. So that that's. How That's the value. I know it like, sounds it's very it's very cold and like it's it's a very callous way of thinking of, of life, but in terms of economics, that's the way you would think. And I could offer a simple socialist critique to that. Well, that mm -hmm. would inherently make some lives more worth others ba based solely on how much how much m money can yeah. By, by how much money can be demanded for over their through the legal system over their loss of life, and yeah, that's true. Yeah, and I'd I'd say that such such you know outside of of a class dynamic, you know, it's a completely arbitrary decision and one that even if it is made, you know, it it could have you know serious implications in uh, in other decisions you know and so ba basically i would i would just then start with the premise that like all lives are equally valuable even if they aren't equally productive or fruitful you know yeah i'm not sure if i would agree i don't i actually don't believe that people's lives are equally valuable i i think some some make themselves i don't think they're equally memorable but valuable that's another thing i don't know like like i'm willing to say that my life is not as valuable as for example albert einstein or isaac newton or um somebody that's really contributed to our society like if in a way if there was a choice to be made to save their life over mine um the the better decision would be to save theirs because just the impact and uh, the, that they've had is bigger. Um, so I, I do believe that there's um, different values to lives. I mean, also like you, it's it's harsh, right? Like, uh, but it's sort of true that we we don't value lives the same. Like, you know, you hear about uh, some accident in North America where maybe five people get killed. And we, we, we say, oh, my goodness, and then there's, like, vigils, and there's, like, a huge outcry. Um, but then, like, a thousand people <laughs> die in some remote country, and, yeah, it's a blip. It's not, like, really a big deal. Yeah, Do well, I, mean? I, yeah, I get what you're saying, you know. I, you know, but to that, I would think that, you know, it's, you know that the the reasons behind the losses of those lives, um, especially in in the uh, in the less talked about one, it could it it could tell us a, a lot more about like a problem that we have to fix as a society and as a planet perhaps if necessary, and and so and, and yeah I get you know the thing is I believe that all lives are equally valuable but some are like in the grand scheme of things as far as you know how the universe works you know what is most what you know what is necessary to bring about the most positive results you know i think that some lives are ultimately more expendable to that end than others in a given moment but mm -hmm. they all have the same value ultimately cuz and I think uh, Game of Thrones, even it's it's a good example of that kind of idea because you know the, I mean you'd probably put the greatest value on like who your favorite character is and who you want to see on the Iron Throne, but mm -hmm. ultimately the you know the the powers that be don't 
see it the same way. They just, you know, see, you know, some might see it like there's, like there's, in order to get themselves on on the throne or to get the best person on the throne, you know, certain sacrifices have to be made, you know, certain betrayals happen and stuff like that. And, <laughs> and yeah, because, I mean... I was I was rooting for the Starks all the way, but like you know, someone, I like the Starks too. Yeah, but like I mean, some if someone were to say to me that like Daenerys sitting on the Iron Throne, you know, had greater positive implications, you know, in the future going forward, you know, I would I would understand, you know, the necessity for the Starks, you know, to not to not have the power to seek the throne or even to be destroyed if necessary. But, mm -hmm. you know, I wouldn't say that they, they were less valuable than, than Daenerys or, or, or her bloodline even. You know, I would just say that, you know, her, her life was more instrumental towards bringing about the best possible future than the Starks were. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm sort of a, um, I guess I'm a bit of a realist. Um, and the way I see things is I, I see humans as being selfish creatures, uh, intrinsically selfish, uh, and not necessarily for bad, like not in a bad way necessarily, but, um, but we try to protect the ones around us, right? Like your, mm -hmm. your mom or your dad or your, your siblings or, um, will always be more important to you as an individual uh, than some random person that you've never met and never will meet, right? Mm -hmm. So intrinsically, those people are the the people that are close to you are the most valuable people, right? Right. Yeah. And and, and I would say, right, and society might have that kind of, like. So if you take that kind of to a, a larger scale, um, like when we hear the news of a plane crash, they don't. They, they say, okay, 100 people died or whatever. And then they say, well, of those 100 people, 20 of them were Americans. And it's those 20 that we're really concerned about because those have a closer connection to us than the other 80 that um, might be from countries that we're just not familiar with. So we, we do sort of naturally assign value based on our relationships to people and how connected we are. So if a celebrity dies, for example, uh, we might say, hey, that, oh my goodness, Michael Jackson's dead. That's when we freak out about that. <laughs> Whereas if somebody that, you know, was an, just a nobody dies, we don't really care because we just don't have that connection. And I think it's those connections um, that really give, a, give us a sense of value of that person. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I and I think I think that's an under that's understandable, you know, to value human lives in such a way, but I think it also it 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 can it's I think it's something that can be detrimental also. Like especially like if you if you look at policing in uh in America with minority <laughs> communities especially because uh many Many of the police officers uh, policing those communities, you know, they don't have a similar connection to the to the people they're policing over. Whereas it's it's a more common thing in in you know more prosperous you know well off communities. But and so and so yeah, if if you take it, you know, there's you basically you kind of have a disparity in how much the uh, how much the officer values, you know, from their own subjectively values the the people that he's protecting. The, yeah, and sure. Yeah, and so ba basically, when if you're in a state in a place where the the value is much lower, you know, more becomes permissible in the act of policing them. You know, whereas some someone who would place greater value on the people they're policing, you know, they would probably treat their, their pe the people with, 
more respect, with more dignity, but still they would impress upon them the necessity of their actions, their sure. duties. But you, that courtesy prob might not be extended to the less valued people. You know, you, what, the, are you, the, the point you're making, I totally agree with, actually. Um, and this is why it's important uh, that the people that um, protect, like act as police officers in a community, are, should be members of that community. Yeah, um, and, it and I think that's important. Um, and also, I think there should be um, a better reception between the communities and the police. Like a lot of the time, there's a, a there's like groups like Black Lives Matter, for example, who really create a, a distrust between police and the people that they're trying to protect. Um, uh, and it's a real well, problem. Um, to see. Okay. Well, uh, what if I was to uh, tell you that I had both personal knowledge and ob objective proof, um, at least anecdotally, anecdotally speaking, sure. uh, that of a of such an example of a a black person, you know, pol being a police officer in their community and also interacting peacefully and respectfully with Black Lives Matter activists. Yeah, it can happen. Um, the problem is a lot of the time, like a lot of the leaders of Black Lives Matter call for the, you know, removal of all police. They want to get rid of all police. They want to get rid of, um, you know, this is in their own doctrine, doctrine of Black I Lives see. Matter. Well well, it's, it's actually funny you say that. Have you ever Googled the uh, phrase 11 major misconceptions about Black Lives Matter? I've actually read the Black Lives Matter site. Uh, what part of the site? Uh, their whole site. Their whole site. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of this, I was really shocked. Um, a lot of it's very um, pro, like, gay, lesbian stuff. And um, not necessarily pro-black men very almost not really pro black men at all i was surprised how you'd think it should be pro black in general right but it's uh, not necessarily well, positive toward black men um well well uh yeah it's actually funny you say that though because i you know i've read into like the reasons for that too and i would agree that ex there is very little explicit you know support for the black male but there the reasons they give on the site for that is because as it's actually more of a historical acknowledgement of the civil rights era and how the civil rights movement went. And so basically, and, and it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier with the Green New Deal, where ba basically when, you know, when the advancements were made, when the movement had gained the ground it sought out after, you know, it's that, that some people didn't benefit equally from that and they weren't, they didn't get as much recognition for their actions in, in making that possible. And so pretty much that Black Lives Matter, like princi on principle, the reason they make more emphasis about those groups is because those groups, it, it's for much the same reason that they don't want to repeat the same mistake, you know, going forward. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a very I'm very against Black Lives Matter. I see it as sort of like the KKK of our time um, because I, they've I've they've actually that. called for people's deaths and people have acted upon it. Um, uh, you know, which, which specific people? Uh, there was a reporter and that was murdered. Uh, there was the, the Texas shooter. Um, there was a bunch of things. There, there was um, one of the leaders. Uh, said, you know, go out and shoot white people. <laughs> it's like pretty crazy. Uh, do, you, do you remember? It was a uh, local, local to me, uh, Black Lives Matter uh, leader. Um, uh, the guy from Philadelphia? Them. No, in uh, Toronto. Oh, Toronto. Uh, okay. They were basically calling for blacks to go out and kill, find a white person to kill. Um, it was oh, pretty oh, crazy. So, so basically it initiated... Initiation kills for the upcoming race war. I uh, 
Yeah. I, 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 heard, I heard that one. Yeah, it's, it's actually funny because, um, I'm sorry, I don't mean to get off topic with that. Yeah, yeah, no, but, it's, okay. it's okay. But yeah, hey, it's, we, like that's actually the, the thing about uh, Black Lives Matter too. Like they, they actually have more, a more decentralized, you know, structure. That's as true. As, yeah. That's so, and so pretty much even though there are certain ideas that they, in theory, like unite behind, like their practice is usually quite different. And mm -hmm. yeah, and I, and I can tell you just from firsthand experience, you know, I've, you know, I like the, uh, the Chicago branch, you know, chapter of, of mm -hmm. the movement um, that, you know, I like, I, I think like their case in, in particular is that for, for what they're up against, you know, for who, for the, um, for, for the forces acting against them in their, in their goals, you know, I'd say that they've handled things, you know, a, a lot better than, than say like St. Minneapolis where like those were the people who, who like did the infamous, uh, pigs in a blanket thing. Yeah. But, yeah. That's the big famous one, right? Uh, yeah. But like another thing though is it, it's actually funny though, cause like I can, I can tell you it's more likely than not that they le they learned from that mistake because I actually saw later uh, local footage of a protest they were at where they actually like they did more of a proper protest, you know, peaceful one, you know, they, you know, and they basically did what, what their claim, what they claim to do or what they claim to believe on their website. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I, I think but a lot of their ideology is based on a lie. I mean, Michael Brown is their big, you know, the, the, the original thing that inspired the movement, right? Yeah, but, but you know, well, the hands up, don't that, shoot thing yeah, well, was well, a total lie. Yeah, I've heard that, that statement, but like, the uh, but originally it, it actually had to do with uh, Trayvon Martin, but and again Trayvon Martin, he was yeah. a thug. Um, if I mean I if by thug you meant well he attacked like, he, Zimmerman. Well, I mean it's possible he did that, but in any well, no, case, the, no, like, it's, the, it, there's no, evidence. That's the thing. Zimmerman that instigated the conflict, though. It like on. Like he was told, he was ordered by the police specifically not to pursue. Yeah, him. And but, for another thing, I can, like, I do understand why he would possibly, he would think that Trayvon was up to no good at that point, especially mm -hmm. given there was rob, there was a robbery in the neighborhood, you yeah. know, prior to that night, you know, from someone apparently matching his description, but yet. Mm -hmm. And Zimmerman is not a racist. He's uh, not. Like he's he was actually his thing that's was that's actually uh, not true though. Like, no, no, he's not a racist. He his no, thing is his later actions were qu were actually quite racist though. Well, he's, he he's a black loose a youth leader, right? He that, was he, that doesn't he, mean he can't be racist. Well, I mean, <laughs> Look, I, I think yeah, I, I think I they that, try to paint him as a racist, but uh, well, I you know, think I think in that case, you know, race wasn't handled the best like as far as using but it, it, it had nothing to do with race on the event i mean in some in some way it had like more of a tertiary effect on race but it really i'd say the big like i'd say as far as the racial component goes it would probably the most it would have to do was like the rigor with which his his claims were vetted you know even you know because for another thing, like, did you know that that not only did Trayvon not even have a history of violence, you know, bef at least one that was documented prior to that mm -hmm. event, Zimmerman did for another thing. Like, sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, I actually did know all that. But the point is, uh, yeah. you know, uh, Trayvon Martin was bashing Zimmerman's head against the ground. And I could argue. And was trying to I kill him. I, would, I could argue too that like if, like especially if Zimmerman had, knew the laws on like how he could how he could best defend himself in that case, I I would say it's possible that like he he would have to allow for a bit of sandbagging even you know like allow him to do some serious harm 
you know, but he could still have instigated the conflict complete. Well, like, the thing have... is, Trayvon Martin was probably high. You know, he um, had drug paraphernalia I, on him. Except no. It, like, the, the toxicology reports that suggested yeah. that given the level of THC in his system, he would have, the last time he would have smoked would have been a couple days before that. Now, don't ask me how I know this, but I have never met someone or been someone who has been high for two days. I mean. Yeah, no, no. But I think th that's that's one type of drug that was potentially in the system, but he was probably high on marijuana. Yeah, but because... that's, that's, all, that's another thing, too. Like, pot doesn't necessarily make you more violent. And it depends. That's actually... It reacts to di people differently. Um, yeah. So that's another thing, though. If if that's how it reacted to him, like he, there would be a better chance that he could have gotten in trouble for doing something like that, you know. But again, he didn't. He had no like documented history of violence or anything. But you know, for an, for another thing, that that's also where I'd argue the race that race might have come in to like the rigors with which the crime was investigated, even because like. Zimmerman himself didn't get any toxicology report, and I mean, he, but Zimmerman's yeah. not even white. First of all, <laughs> like, it's not what a white does this race matter? Like he still instigated a conflict and killed someone at, as a result. Well, like I don't know if he really did instigate it. That's the point. Like, but he did though. Like no, he was like his job. Not he, to he's get a out community of watch guy, and he, he saw somebody acting sus suspiciously. That shouldn't have been there. Who and he was told not to pursue. I know he was told not to pursue, but his job, his, you know, his job as a community watch guy was to pursue. <laughs> you know, but, and yeah, I, you might, you know, I could argue that, yes, you're right, that uh, he probably should have listened to the police and just sort of stayed back. But, um you know, that's not what happened. And that was a mistake on Zimmerman's part. But it wasn't a racist mistake. It wasn't a mistake where he was trying to instigate something. He was just basically trying to protect his community. Yeah, but that's another thing, too. It was a mistake. He was not rigor. He was not really... It, the gravity of his mistake was not imparted on him, onto him sufficiently, I would argue. Like, even if... Like, if I accepted the idea that he didn't act out of any racial animus or anything like that, mm -hmm. you know, his act, I still believe firmly he acted, his actions were wrong and that, and but they were But do you not. believe that he should have the right to defend himself? I like, do, but that's, the thing is, what, the context of how he used that power was not in defense, but in attack. I don't considered. like he only did it after his head is being literally bashed against the ground. Yeah, but that's the thing though. If you go that start can kill you. Fight, <laughs> no, but that I get that. But the thing is, if you go in there starting the fight, you know, you but, sure you can defend yourself in the fight, but that but you starting the, the fight ultimately makes your you the offensive party, like and offense has more to do with attack you know yeah so the thing is so the question becomes and we don't know the answer to this truly because it's you know both parties are not alive to to, to say what really happened um but we don't know who instigated it we don't yeah. know except we do though like how he willfully disobeyed a in order but that doesn't from, mean that he from the law, but that's the thing. He, at, acting in the capacity of a community watch person, deferred his actions for a, for a moment to the authority of the law. And when the law told him what to do in that scenario, he willfully disobeyed it. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that he instigated the fight. He, yes, he, it does. Sure, he ignored the police, and that was a mistake. I agree. Um, but... It doesn't mean that he walked over to Zimmerman and start, uh, you know, uh, to Pavel Martin. I mean, and started fighting with him. It could have been that, you know, hey, he said, hey, stop or whatever. Like I'm just playing out some scenario. He could have said, stop. You know, what are you doing in this neighborhood? 
and sort of questioned him, and then he got attacked. You know, who knows what happened? We we don't know the the truth of what happened because we don't have both witnesses to 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 give us that truth. Yeah, well, that is what I would argue is still a problem, even like where where it comes to to where the law is concerned, especially because you know it kind of re- renders like the. Like it's a problem with the legal system. Like when some something like that, you know, when cops are supposed to be the ones who who have the authority to to question people like that, and, and but we you know, do but, have we, we do have laws where we can protect our neighborhood. You know, that's why we have community watch. Um, we yeah, well, do, I, but the thing is, I think it's ultimately it's. You know, it's one of those things where defending your community is one thing, but it, for another or thing. But actually, you know, it's an important that's dynamic. What Black Lives Matter is calling for, by the way. They don't want police. They want people to actively, you know, do what Zimmerman did, basically. I, I can t- tell you that's actually not the case, because especially with Chicago in particular, um, the, um, a specific policy idea they're going for is rather to have a, a citizen accountability council. Who, who can be dem- elected from the neighborhood and who can who can hold the police more accountable like that's kind of you know antithetical to the idea of no police okay well so I'm only going by what I heard certain leaders say within the organization so yeah, well I mean uh, if if you've heard if something new has come up then like yeah all right I'll, yeah. I'll defer to your knowledge on that one. Yeah, and that, and that's ultimately the problem with just following leaders. You know, leaders can have very bad ideas and mm-hmm. can stray from the, the stated principles. And so, yeah, I it's actually funny because I like now I I feel like I should finally get it uploaded because I did film like a Black Lives Matter march. You know, and so okay. it, yeah, it's only Wait, like from when couple years ago i know I'm uh, okay. bad. <laughs> but, uh, oh well hey it's only a couple of years late though <laughs> yeah i know but, but yeah I, i'll uh yeah i'll upload that i'll i'll send you a link to it sure. you know and yeah yeah i'll also what i would i i kind of have to go right now unfortunately oh, okay but, but uh yeah so pretty much i'd i'd encourage you to look into that you know look into their policies even you know and, and and yeah, that that could be a good talk to have another day, you know. Yeah. See, I just I just don't like when they jump to the race conclusion. Um, you know, I, I really I think that's a mistake, and it it only creates more division between the different groups. Yeah. You know? Co- couldn't agree more. Well. Uh, okay, cool. An- anyway, you uh, take care. Okay. Have have a good weekend. Okay. You too. Okay. Bye, bye for now.